Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Harry Atwater, Editor-in-Chief of uh, ACS Photonics, and I wanna welcome you to our ACS Photonics Global Webinar Series. Uh, and we're very pleased this morning to, uh, or it's a morning in California, but uh, whatever time of day it is where you are, uh, uh, to uh, welcome Elena Vukovic, um, who's gonna be uh, giving us a lecture about the subject of inverse designed uh, uh, quantum photonics. So combining two very exciting topics in photonics. Uh, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to her uh, seminar. And bef before we get started, what uh, Elena has ag uh, agreed to do, I I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about her, her uh, from a, a biographical viewpoint. Then we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion uh, about uh, uh, and hear, hear a little bit from her before her seminar about her um, uh, her experiences and outlook on the field of photonics. So Elena Vukovic, uh, Professor Vukovic is uh, Jensen Huang Professor in Global Leadership in the School of Engineering uh, and a Professor of Electrical Engineering and Applied Physics at Stanford University. Uh, and she leads the Nanoscale and Quantum Photonics Lab. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Professor Vukovic uh, earned her PhD at uh, Caltech uh, and uh, was a, a postdoc at Stanford and then a junior faculty member there and has also been a, uh, uh, had uh, visiting appointments in the uh, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics uh, and the Technical University of Munich and Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, she's a recipient of uh, numerous awards, including the uh, Harvey Engineering Research Prize, Distinguished Scholar of the Max Planck Institute, uh, and uh, uh, Hans Fischer Senior Fellowship from the, the uh, Institute of Advanced Study in Munich and the Humboldt Prize. Uh, and uh, uh, among her uh, also uh, US uh, uh, Career Awards include uh, DARPA Young Faculty Award and the Presidential Early Career uh, award for science and engineering, as well as the ONR Young Investigator Award and numerous others. Uh, she's a fellow of the uh, American Physical Society, the Optical Society, and the Institute of uh, Electronics and Electrical Engineers. Um, so um, welcome and good morning, uh, Yelena. Here we are. It's uh, the day after election day in the United States, and uh, we're, we're all up early. Uh, and so I think what our, uh, you know, our uh, uh, viewership here for the webinar would be really interested in learning a little bit about your life story and uh, how you came to where you are today and, uh, and then your outlook on directions in photonics. And uh, maybe we could begin with, you know, what is it that inspired you to get into science at an early age and uh, follow the path that you're on? Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, yeah. thanks, Harry, for your kind introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Um, it's a great pleasure. Um, so, so as for how I got to um, uh, work in this field or become a scientist, I, I grew up in Serbia, uh, and um, um, my brother got interested, my older brother got interested in science, in physics uh, uh, first, and then, you know, uh, growing up, uh, he um, thought that that's something that I may be interested in, so actually he ignited my interest in physics primarily, and and over there you get physics in sixth grade, um, uh, all the kids actually get physics in sixth grade in, in middle school, and I um, ended up having a great physics teacher, very inspiring physics teacher, with whom we were doing labs, and, and little experiments and so on. And, you know, I, I uh, ended up enjoying physics a lot because I always liked math, but I couldn't really connect it to kind of world around me and physics, physics, once I started learning physics, kind of math started having much more sense, right? Because it would suddenly yeah. be applied to real things around me. Um, so I, I continued, uh, working on, on kind of math and physics related things. And that was, that was those ended up being my favorite subjects and, and ended up going to school specialized in those subjects and studied electrical engineering. And as Harry said, I came to the US for grad school. Uh, I came to Caltech. Although at that time I, I didn't really, um, I was not sure really what, what field I would be working on. So I picked photonics during grad school. Okay, so that, uh, that was the, uh, 
the, the deciding moment, at least to go in the direction of photonics was. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah very yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, one of the, your, your, of course, your seminar title is uh, 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 very intriguing because it combines uh, two very uh, important emerging topics. I think one of the things, uh, and of course, all over the world, but especially in the United States, we're seeing a big investment in quantum information science and technology. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of interested in the question of uh, what you think about the role of photonics and quantum information science and technology. You know, in some sense, it's it's not inevitable that photonics was go is going to play a role. Uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, com computational platforms based on RF superconducting circuits that don't yeah. particularly involve photonics. Um, so what do you see as the outlook or the impact for photonics and quantum information science and technology? Um, I think that irrespective of the platform, photonics would play a role, uh, even for superconducting qubits, because um, connecting uh, different superconducting uh, processors or superconducting computers where, um, you know, uh, cryogenically cooled transmission lines, although there was some, some beautiful work at ETH in the group of Andreas Morgoff uh, a few months ago where they connected. Uh, when they cooled superconducting line several meters long and connected to dilution refrigerators, clearly this is not really scalable. So people, even for superconducting computers, will have to use uh, photonics eventually to connect the different nodes or, or different uh, processors, uh, which means also that you need to transduce signals from microwave to optical frequencies. So um, I, I I mean, it is not completely clear, uh, as probably most of you know, all of the quantum information technologies are sort of at the cusp of, of doing something yeah. interesting and useful, but it's not, com I mean, it's still not at the stage where they can really do things that we cannot really do classically. There is a lot of discussion about it, and people are, of course, making great, uh, great progress on all of that. Um, <clears throat> and it's also not completely clear which platform will, will win. Uh, because right. right now superconducting yeah. processors have scaled more, but you know ion-based platforms, atomic-based platforms are also scaling, and you know there are spin spins in solids that people are also working on, including myself, that are also very promising. But you know if you look all of the platforms, I think these interconnections between different nodes or processors or or computers, I mean, are always important and there is nothing better than photonics to implement them. So yeah, I, and and my, my view is that you need photonics for everything, even if you don't yeah. really do computation using photonics. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, I'm sure that'll be welcome news to our audience. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that's, you brought up the uh, example of, a, uh, you know, an RF, uh, 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 essentially communication link uh, needing to be cryogenically cooled, but that really speaks to the beautiful coherence that we can enjoy in photonics uh, uh, for communications. And so that's perhaps, yeah, as you point out, a very interesting advantage. Um, and distance and the long distance propagation with very low loss. I mean, that's a very yeah, big, big, yeah. big issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe this is uh, also plays into your answer to the next question, but the, that is, a, you know, what do you see as the in, in terms of the outlook, maybe on a ten-year time scale, uh, in photonics? Uh, you're you're involved in quantum photonics. Uh, uh, clearly, you, you think that's important. And uh, but overall, in the field of photonics, what do you see as being emerging or important trends uh, uh, in the in yeah. the field? Uh, well. Um... I, well, one one actually important trend, and this is what I will be talking about today primarily, is this uh, uh, merging of uh, optimization and machine learning computational mm -hmm. techniques with photonics. And I, I think we see more and more of that in all of the areas of photonics. And um, of course, I'm very excited about it since I've been, been working on it for a long time. But I, I'm also very excited with seeing all the results of that beautiful work because because uh, I think we're kind of opening, uh, get, get going in the directions that uh, in photonics that we haven't seen before, opening new applications, seeing some, some completely uh, different devices and structures. And, and I really think that this is uh, opening a new era in photonics in terms of scalability yeah. and, and functionality and so on for, for pretty much all of the applications. 
Um, and um, I, I think that's a very exciting direction and that will keep going on for a long time because I'll, I'll be talking about it later later on in my talk and, and you know, about unsolved problems and so on. Uh, but I, I do think that that's kind of a uh, paradigm changer for photonics and, and yeah. that's something that, that is uh, becoming more and more um, used kind of mainstream of photonics. Uh, the other actually directions are I, I, I think uh, we see a lot of uh, kind of hybrid platforms, uh, old materials used in photonics, you know, lithium niobate, silicon carbide, but with improved uh, uh, material properties, also new material, you know, new materials such as 2D materials, and then yeah. also hybrid systems combining a lot of different materials. I do think that these hybrid platforms uh, are going to play a very big role because, of course, there is no ideal material to do the whole photonic system. But we yeah. do see uh, new methods of integration uh, and uh, um, high quality platforms involving multiple materials. And I think we'll see much more and more of that. I'm actually very excited about seeing all these yeah. new materials and people thinking in different directions. It's not just silicon anymore, which also right. opens a lot of new, new doors. And, um, and I think people are much more open to using new materials right now than they were maybe 15 years ago when, you know, yeah. everything other than silicon was really not, not acceptable. Um, and, uh, um, and then in quantum, uh, I, I think that, as I mentioned in response to the other question, we have to use photonics for connections. So yeah. um, 10 years from now, no matter what platform uh, wins and gets scaled the most, we'll see a lot of photonics. You know, in atomic mm -hmm. or ion-based platform, we'll see a lot of integrated photonics for high-speed control of atoms. In superconducting platform, we'll see photonics for interfacing superconducting processors and for quantum transduction. And, you know, maybe we even see scaled processors that are based on, um, you know, for example, optically controllable spins in, in some semiconductors, right. which is also integra right. all integrated photonics, right? Yeah. So, um, so we will see yeah. actually photonics play, play a big role there and we'll see yeah. some very, really, you know, complex and beautiful photonic integrated circuits, yeah. Okay, good. Well, um, yeah, and then finally, before we get to your seminar, uh, you know, particularly in these pandemic times, I think uh, students and early career scientists are interested in the question of, you know, what is what would be your advice to students, uh, uh, both uh, nowadays at this particular moment, but more broadly uh, as they pursue their early careers. Well, for the pandemic time, actually, I mean, it's very, it is hard to, you know, think about uh, your your life goals and plans. But I tell my students, try to, you know, focus on where you would like to see yourself a few years from now or five yeah. years from now. Because, of course, we, we know from history, you know, pandemics happen and they pass. And, you know, you should, you should think about where you would like to be five years from now. Uh, and, you know, this should not... Uh, um, I mean, if you're really have, uh, if you're really passionate about working in academia and, you know, be, having a research group, you should not really change your life goals because of what yeah. difficulties that we're going through right now. Um, and, you know, we all know also from history that a lot of famous scientists and engineers went through very difficult times that included wars and pandemic and, and, and pandemics and so on, and they were still productive and, and uh, didn't impact their career paths. But, you know, just in general, for every time, I do think that people should uh, really uh, focus primarily on, on, you know, what they enjoy doing and what their priorities in life are. Uh, so if someone really... Um, uh, for someone who uh, really enjoys working on problems that they pick themselves, I think that working, for example, in academia is the ideal job because you mm -hmm. really pick your problems that you are interested in, and then you build experiments and you work on solving them. So that that level of flexibility is something that you mostly have in academic profession. And then, you know, for people who primarily are focused on um, developing, a, you know, product over five five year time scale, you know, building something that would go into augmented reality glasses everywhere in five years, you know, then of course they should probably focus on finding a job in industry, right? And, yeah. you know, in my own group, I kind of see uh, see people with, with both of them, I mean, across the spectrum of interests. And sometimes yeah. people kind of change their interests along the grad school, you know, start with, 
interests in academia and then by the time they graduate they think oh i would like to do something that makes a more immediate impact than you know waiting yeah. 15 years to see it right so really think about what your priorities are what you enjoy doing and then and just just follow that yeah yeah Okay, very good. Well, that's uh, thank you for taking this time uh, for us. It's a really great and fascinating to hear your outlook on uh, science and on uh, uh, life in general. Uh, and so now we can go ahead and turn to your seminar. Uh, so if you want to bring your your yeah, slides definitely. up, we'll go ahead and start with that. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, and uh, so as I mentioned at uh, introduction, um, you know, uh, Professor Vukovic is going to uh, tell us about inverse design quantum photonics, merging these two fascinating subjects. So, Yelena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Harry. So now I will tell you about inverse design in photonics, and this is what I mentioned in response to Harry's question. One of the uh, areas where I, I really see, but that I'm most excited about in, in photonics today, which is merging these modern computational techniques, uh, machine learning, um, AI techniques, optimization techniques with, with photonics design. And of course, this is applicable to many other fields, but I think in the context of photonics, this is something that we've been seeing happening over the past 15 years or so. And, and that's what we refer to as inverse design. And I really think that this opens a lot of opportunities as you'll hopefully see uh, in my talk. Um, so I don't think for this audience, I need to, to um, explain why what photonics applications are and why, why photonics is exciting, but these are just some of them, I mean, that, that we're focusing on today, which includes optical interconnects, uh, uh, building optical neural networks, uh, optical computational systems, LIDAR, augmented reality glasses, various sensing systems, and, and various quantum technologies. Uh, and of course, for all of these applications, free space optical solutions and these bulky optical systems that you know, we build in our labs are not really um, sufficiently good because they have very large footprints. You cannot really fit them inside of augmented reality glasses or a portable microscope or, or a sensor. So we need to actually go with integrated photonic solutions, uh, something where we can actually integrate a lot of components on a single chip. And really what we would like to do is integrate, you know, in some cases, millions of components on a chip um, and go through the same type of, of um, uh, transition that electronics in 20th century went through, where from, you know, large scale computers that occupy the whole buildings in mid 20th century. Now we have much more powerful processors <clears throat> inside of our cell phones. So how do we do the same for photonics? How do we actually integrate millions of components efficiently inside of photonic processors? Um, if you revisit this kind of traditional uh, mainstream photonics today, it, as you all know, it's pretty bulky. We have tens of micrometers per components. And, and here we're talking about um, filters and WDM devices for, for kind of conventional photonic systems. This is what most of the industrial uh, uh, labs and, and commercial products would have inside of their photonic chips, like this written uh, variety of uh, large uh, scale uh, splitters and filters and so on that are very bulky, um, tens of microns or, or more, uh, then they would be very sensitive to fabrication, temperature changes. So you would see all of these heaters, uh, thermal tuners integrated together with these components to tweak them on resonance with the rest of the components so that you can actually build some functional uh, system consisting of many, many components. Uh, then they would be designed by manual tuning of few design parameters. I mean, sort of, you know that this is a filter and then you start tweaking waveguide width and separation and and few things there and maybe add some notch somewhere where you tune and that's how you design the system. But there is no reason to believe that any of those are optimal because you really brute force optimize all, all of them with changes of only only few parameters. And they also have very limited functionalities because if you kind of completely invent a new function for some photonic components, there is usually no solution in the library that, that uh, we're aware of. And, and I'll show you some new functionalities that you can actually design once you've changed uh, the approach of designing photonics. And finally, as a result of all of this, um, the state of the art photonics is pretty lossy and inefficient. I mean, if you look even at commercial photonic systems, you will see couplers, fiber uh, couplers to chip that have on efficiencies on the order of 40%. Or you have 
um, if you in optical interconnect systems you have uh, you consume on the order of picojoule per transmitted bit if you add up all of the losses uh, all of the energy consumption that you have in the tuning elements and other uh, inefficiencies in other parts of the system so this picojoule per bit is comparable to what people can already achieve with electronic systems uh, operating at comparable speeds of 20 gigahertz which kind of beats the purpose of using photonics for for the application where you can already use improved electronics and then this in coupling loss of 40 to 50 percent although it can be acceptable in classical photonic systems is completely unacceptable in quantum systems where you know that means that you're losing more than 50 percent of your information right and um even in classical systems i don't think it's acceptable because we all know how much energy we consume in data centers and you know saving uh 50 percent of that just by redesigning photonics is a major impact also on our environment and, and energy consumption so we should not really uh be throwing away power just because we didn't really design like good high quality components in our system um so i um what i'll be talking about today is what um kind of the answer to the question of whether we could design and make better photonics uh and the checklist of what we mean by better photonics is given here that means better device performance than what we know today very compact footprints uh, that's also very important because you don't want to spend all, a lot of real estate on your chip if you don't have to. Um, there is also a problem of mismatch between photonics and electronics. Um, we want to make photonics robust to fabrication errors and temperature variations. I think this is very important because all of these tuning elements on photonic chips complicate the, the um, photonic integrated circuit so much that it's completely unacceptable to you know, build something um, or maybe impossible to build something consisting of maybe billions components of components down the road. Uh, we would also like to have novel functionalities and that emerges a lot in a lot of applications. I'll be telling you about some of them later on. Um, and we would like to eliminate this brute force design from uh, a manual parameter tuning from the design process. Uh, because traditional approach in photonics design is that you learn about this library of components in grad school or you know maybe as an undergrad and then you kind of go ahead and you get a job and then you use these components and tweak them a little bit until you build the system and that's not really how photonics design should work in fact we think that maybe we should be more as electronic integrated circuits designers and maybe even electronic integrated circuits designers can design photonics if they have the right type of software that they could use as they already have for electronics design. Um, so my group has been working on this for a long time. In fact, I even started thinking about how to make better photonics in grad school and primarily in the context of photonic crystals. But then in my own group, we've been playing with this for about 15 years or, <clears throat> or even more. Uh, but in 2013, uh, we really made a breakthrough in terms of design where we managed to develop this design method for arbitrary 3d photonic devices which kind of studies explores the full parameter space of fabricable structures and the resulting devices are very non-intuitive i'll tell you more about them in a moment but they do satisfy all the kind of the wish list that i showed you a moment ago and with Alejandro Rodriguez from Princeton, we wrote a review article about two years ago. If you're interested in trends and kind of description, general directions in inverse design in photonics, there is this uh, kind of still uh, up-to-date article. So feel free to read more about it. So what, what do we mean by inverse design? So let me just start with a very simple problem of a waveguide band, which probably all of you are familiar with. Um, if you are making photonic integrated circuit, you need to transmit signals and connect different components. So you need wires and wires are waveguides, right? That guide light. So if you need, and you cannot really always use straight waveguides, right? You have to make a turn somewhere to connect, to connect different parts of the chip. So if you, if you make a 90 degree turn, um, as probably most of you know, that's not going to be a very good and very efficient uh, connector, uh, very efficient wire. It will be only 26% efficient. You will lose most of your power at this corner. Right? And if you're, you know a little bit more about photonics, instead of making 90 degrees band, uh, what you will do is you will kind of uh, curve it a little bit at the corner and that will work a little bit better. You know, so this will be 83% efficient, right? You will not lose as much power at the corner, but you will still lose quite a lot, right? And then of course, you know, if you took up the electronics class, you know that in order to make this even more efficient, you need to make a bigger radius of curvature 
right? So this is sort of how traditional photonics design looks like. If I make a really big radius of curvature, then this is going to be pretty much 100% efficient, right? But of course, there is a problem with that because that means that you nearly need to make very large circuits, right? You <laughs> occupy a lot of footprint on, on making even turns and bands. And then, you know, it becomes super complicated how you connect different parts of the chip and how do you cross this and, and, and so on. So that's not really a solution. But what we mean by inverse design is not doing this, but we mean like basically you pose the problem that you like to solve. <clears throat> you have your input waveguide, you have your output waveguide, you have 90 degrees band, you have some small region, which is maybe a few microns, <clears throat> two microns in size, and you say, okay, can I maximize transition uh, transmission in this two micron footprint uh, so that I have obtained most of the power at the output. And I know if I just make 90 degrees bend, I'll lose almost 80% of the power there, but I'd like to minimize that loss by somehow structuring this corner. And you pose this problem, you put constraints, you put figure of merit, and, and then you try to design it. And of course, even for such a small footprint, if you pixelate it into something like 50 nanometer pixels, you will still have um, 2,500 degrees of freedom um, for just 50 by 50 pixels in this region. So that's two to the power of 2,500 possible designs, which is enormous number of designs, right? So even if you're just combining silicon and air or silicon and oxide here and trying to see whether there is some combination of pixels that works as a, as a waveguide band, you will not, unless you're extremely lucky, you will not really be able to try all of these designs and find the one that works. So you can't really kind of blindly flip the pixels until you find the solutions, but there may be a solution somewhere in this enormous parameter space that solves your problem. So how do you get there? Um, so we use optimization techniques, which means that you still search through that complex, enormous parameter space, but you're guided by the physics of your problem. And guided by physics of your problem means that you define some figure of merit that you're solving, and then you calculate gradients of that figure of merit, which tell you basically which pixels you need to flip primarily. So you are not really flipping them randomly. So here is the structure. You calculate some gradients. Gradients tell you which pixels in the structure are basically uh, the figure of merit is most sensitive on, which you should be flipping. You flip those pixels, you update the structure, you calculate transmission, and then you keep going until you get to the solution. Calculation of gradients is uh, something that, that can be very time consuming and very computationally expensive. So, so there is a good trick in math, which is called adjoint simulation. I mean, it's just few lines of math uh, and you can see that in our papers or review papers or, or thesis in my group, uh, which basically allows you to calculate gradients based on forward and backward simulation. So just from two electromagnetic simulations, you can calculate all gradients inside of the structure and that allows you to repeat the same process, but in a more, much more computationally efficient way. So basically what we're doing is we start from some, some random distribution of pixels or some initial condition, and then following these uh, adjoint uh, uh, simulations by calculation of gradients, we're changing pixels in that structure, updating the structures, calculating uh, transmission until we get to the, the desirable uh, optimal point, which means maximum transmission uh, with certain constraints, minimum feature sizes, uh, and also robustness to variety of conditions in the environment. So for this waveguard uh, band, uh, this optimization would look something like this. You see structure changing. I mean, these are basically updates in the structure that are driven by this um, um, gradient-based um, optimization, right? This is telling you how to change your pixels in order to affect the figure of merit. But in each step, you are also calculating your figure of merit, which is your transmission, maximized transmission, for example, having transmission greater than 90%. And uh, the final solution for the optimized structure would be shown here, which is two micro footprint. Um, of course, this was just a toy example that I, I used in order to show you um, why this is interesting. There are a lot of other examples that, that you can solve, uh, a lot of problems that you can solve here that are um, equally important as bending waveguides. Um, and I'll show you a few others and then show you some practical devices. So let's say you would like to do mode converter, which is another simple problem. Um, but for which in traditional photonics, we don't really have a very good solution, right? <clears throat> mode converter means you have a first order mode at the input and you would like to convert it to, let's say, second order mode to, at the output, another type mode, right? And uh, 
the way we do that in traditional photonics is by a di diabetic mode conversion, which means that you're slowly, let's say, expanding waveguide and you need hundreds of micrometers to do that. So a lot of footprint again. So we, again, in traditional photonics, know how to do things efficiently, but same thing as with the waveguide band, you need to use hundreds of micrometers of footprint to do it efficiently. And that's not really a good thing to do, right? So can we do the same thing, um, but with greater than 90% efficiency in a very small footprint, which is let's say in this case, 2.5 by 1.5 micron footprint. Um, and part of the figure of merit is also efficiency, right? We don't want to solve this problem with 5% efficiency. We want to solve it with efficiency that is in this case greater than 90% or greater than 99% or whatever you would like to do. And there may be other things such as minimum feature sizes and so on. And this is of course many, many orders of magnitude smaller than figure of art, right? Uh, uh, the state of the art. Um, so how do we solve this problem? Uh, again, if you pixelate this, try all combination of pixels, that's a lot of different solutions. I mean, for this tiny structure, even with coarse pixels of 100 nanometers, uh, you will have two to the power of 375, which is 10 to the power of 112 solutions. And again, you can't really simulate all of this to find the one that works. That's really computationally not tractable, which means that you need to use some sort of physics guided uh, optimization. And before, before I show you how that works, I should emphasize that all of these simulations that you see here and optimizations are three-dimensional optimizations. I'm just showing you a cross cut of the three-dimensional structure, which is some slab of material sitting on some low index material. Um, and you can do optimization completely in three dimensions using these approaches, but we constrain just to some simple layout in two dimensions because that's something that we can easily fabricate. We, we are doing basically structures that consist of one optimized um, um, pattern in a single guiding layer or maybe two patterns that are stacked on top of each other. But if you are a um, wizard of fabrication and you can fabricate arbitrary three-dimensional structures, of course, you can optimize the pattern completely in three dimensions. That's, that's possible. So when you see these, these cross cuts, that means that we are still optimizing three-dimensional structure, which is very important. You can't do two-dimensional optimization. You would not really capture all of the performance of the structure. So for this particular problem, the optimization would look something like this. You know, this is the first stage of optimization, which we basically used as to initialize the second stage. We allow permittivity to vary continuously. And you see, feel that the output changing as you're changing the structure and you eventually have a mode converter, but this is not something you can fabricate. And then in the next stage of optimization, uh, you do binary optimization, you load that uh, result of the first stage and yet then you do binary optimization where you fabricate when you dis optimize something that you can fabricate and you stop when you reach the target efficiency of greater than 90 percent and when you have a structure that that is fabricable right so this is the pattern that you would need to fabricate and in a full optimization of a three-dimensional device of this size which is again two by 1.5 microns takes about one hour on gaming gpus so each iteration has two electromagnetic simulations, uh, and uh, this is essentially about 1,000 simulations, which takes about an hour on gaming GPUs, uh, which also tells you that we had to develop very fast electromagnetic solvers in order to do this in a small amount of time. And I think that that's very important for all of these inverse design and optimization, because you don't want to wait two or three weeks to get a uh, result or to see that there is no result to optimization. If you have very fast feedback from the optimization process, you, then you can restart the process and see whether you can converge towards another solution because all of these are local optimization methods. And there is a possibility of speeding this up further as I'll tell you later on and we're working on that, right? But for now it's already pretty fast. It's an hour on gaming GPUs. Here is another example, uh, which is um, inverse design wavelength splitter. So here, for example, you would like to split 1.3 and 1.5 micron wavelengths in a very small footprint. This is essentially like a um, uh, WDM device for that you would traditionally use in optical communications or interconnects, where people, people typically use those large ring resonators to split the different wavelengths. We wanted to do it in a small footprint, like about three by three microns. Uh, and here is how the optimization would look for, for this particular structure. Um, so here you're seeing how structure changes as you're doing optimization. And I should mention that although this is about at least a factor of 10 uh, 
times uh, smaller than traditional WDM devices. Uh, even in this very small footprint, we found about six solutions for that same problem that have very high efficiency, which tells you that how rich parameter space is for these photonic structures and how suboptimally we've been doing design, you know, using traditional methods, because you can find six equally efficient solutions um, to traditional designs in a footprint that is at least 10 times smaller, right? So here is one of the solutions. On the other page, I'll show you another solution which we fabricated and, and tested. So he, this, this is a completely different pattern than the one on the previous page, but actually it's the same footprint and has the same efficiency. And again, we do optimization of a two-dimensional pattern, but during the optimization, we actually simulate structures that are three-dimensional, that are in this case having silicon layers sitting on oxide. And here are the fabricated devices um, that you see at the bottom. Here are more fabricated pictures. Um, and then what we do, um, we simulate performance. You know, here uh, we're looking into how transmission changes there is your changing wavelength. Uh, we designed these to be broadband. Uh, we transmit initially the first 100 nanometer bandwidth around 1.3 on the, to the top port, the other 100 nanometer bandwidth to the bottom port. We intentionally designed these to be broadband. You can also design them to be narrowband. This is all part of the design process. But here, uh, the goal was to design it to be actually broadband and also robust to variety of errors. Um, and then when you measure them, um, here is the result of the measurement transmission. Um, uh, for that particular device, you see that it kind of agrees with, with what we designed. Uh, and I should mention that these are measurement results for many devices on the chip that we fabricated that are just plotted on top of each other without any post-fabrication tuning, which is very exciting because, as you probably know, in photonics, <laughs> using traditional structures, that's not something that you can normally achieve without post-tuning. You know, measure transmission and things are detuned from each other. So then you have to tune them in order to bring them on resonance. But here, everything lines up because we designed it to be robust to the typical fabrication errors that we, we normally have. And then you can extend that to three channel wavelength splitter, like the one at the bottom. Uh, and again, these are measurements for the three channel wavelength splitter for many devices on the chip. Uh, this one is a little bit bigger, four by five microns, but not dramatically bigger, although it has three channels. And um, since we've been working on this for a long time, we developed a software suite, which we called Stanford Photonics Inverse Design Software, uh, SPINS, um, and uh, right now quite a few companies, major companies and also research groups are using it. Actually, you can, you can obtain li academic license or, or industrial license from Stanford, uh, but we also have an open source basic version. Um, on GitHub uh, that also a lot of researchers are playing with. This is not a full re version. It doesn't have publication constraints and, and all of the things that we have in the full version, but you know, people are, are also uh, using it for uh, and upgrading it and playing with it for, for their purposes. And if you're interested in re reading more about how this whole SPINS uh, software works, uh, we wrote a review per paper earlier this year um, in Applied Physics Review. So uh, for all practical uh, applications, of course, it's important to have some design process that is also compatible with uh, foundry-based fabrication, high-throughput fabrication. And we spent um, last past few years uh, working, focusing on that. Um, and we're very happy to report that this design process is fully compatible with foundry-based fabrication, right? Because you, if you are just constrained to electron beam lithography, that is um, not very high throughput pro fabrication process that is not really uh, compatible with, you know, manufacturing a large number of devices uh, uh, commercially, our large number of circuits commercially. So we wanted to prove that this is fully compatible with foundry fabrication. And we work with pretty much all of the uh, major foundries. Uh, I'll show you results that we obtained with AIM Photonics in collaboration with John Bowers' group from UC Santa Barbara. But we've also worked with other major foundries, including uh, global foundries, and we worked with IME, and the results are actually excellent with all of the other foundries. So, so uh, it pretty much works, right? So what we're doing here is we're repeating the same design process, but you have to use 
foundry fabrication constraints, which you can obtain from their design rule check. And then you redesign devices that are compatible with foundry fabrication constraints. And then when you obtain your device layout, you basically just send your GDS file to the foundry. Uh, they run, again, their design rule checks. They tell you if something needs to be changed, and then they fabricate it on, on their uh, integrated circuits. Uh, so we in the first uh, round of uh, fabrication with Infotonics, we sent some devices that we already had already demonstrated at Stanford and some that we haven't demonstrated. Um, and, you know, at that time, we didn't even know, know their fabrication constraints. So we basically just sent things that we designed with our fabrication constraints at Stanford, which was meaning feature size at over 80 nanometers. So one of the devices was this three channel wavelength splitter which we had fabricated at Stanford. This is our Stanford fabrication. This is in photonics fabrication of exactly the same device, the same design. Uh, this is the theoretically predicted behavior. And I show you our measurements on the EB fabricated devices. And these are measurements on the foundry based, uh, foundry fabricated devices. Again, many, many devices on the chip, they all line up and they actually work beautifully well. There is a minor drop in the transmission here, which is a result of the fact that minimum feature size that they can achieve are on the order of around 100 nanometers. Uh, we know that now, but at that time we sent them designs that had some features of 80 nanometers. So when you redesign it for minimum features of 100 nanometers, you can push this transmission even higher up. But we designed this for um, in our e-beam devices for transmission that was around the order of 2 to 3 dB. Um, here is another device that we had not previously demonstrated, spatial mode splitter and converter. This is about two by two microns in size. Uh, the idea here is that the first order mode goes to one port, the second order mode is converted to first order mode and distributed to the other port. Again, this is all silicon on insulator, which is capped by insulator on, on top. Uh, we made cascade of these two devices uh, so that we could easily measure um, transmission, kind of S matrix transmission between different ports. This is theoretically predicted behavior. Uh, we expect 2 dB in this broadband bit for cascade of two devices, so sort of 1, one dB per device. Uh, and then we measured, and we measure about 1, 1.5 dB per device, so again, as a result of this small discrepancy in minimum feature sizes. But again, this was measured for many devices on the chip, so it's kind of quite remarkable that on the first try, it all, all worked beautifully well. It's even something that, that uh, in terms of the footprint and, and efficiencies, acceptable and actually better than what people often use in commercial systems. So that's that's very exciting. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to work with foundries and you know working also on some integrated photonic and electronic circuits. But I'd like to show you some few results now of new functionalities that have been enabled by, by inverse design because the previous ones are not really new functionalities. It's you know have old functionality that can be done in a smaller footprint or with a better efficiency or robust to fabrication errors or environmental errors, but there's there are also new things that you can do. So one of the things that we did uh, recently in collaboration with a group of Andrea Lu uh, from City University of New York was non-reciprocal uh, transmission and routing in passive silicon photonics. And this is based on Andrea's uh, theoretical proposal, um, which they also demonstrated experimentally using microwave circuits. Uh, where the idea is to achieve non-reciprocal transmission by cascading two resonators, uh, one of which is a nonlinear resonator. Um, and you can design the system in such a way that you um, kind of couple different amount of power to the nonlinear resonator in the forward and backward direction. And in that case, that also means different nonlinear shift of that resonator in the forward and backward direction which means that at the operating frequency of your laser, you will have different transmission characteristics going forward and backward, which also means different transmission going forward and backward. So they, they um, analyzed this theoretically, proposed it, analyzed, you know, did a demonstration in microwave circuits, but doing this op in optic at optical frequencies was challenging because we didn't really have elements that we could stack up to, to do this, right, off the shelf elements. So we need to design elements that had desired transmission characteristics. Um, and with inverse design, that's pretty simple. You obtain desired transmission 
configuration characteristics for each component here. And then you just run inverse design on um, uh, this element until you achieve desired transmission. And we started from the configuration where we have two racetrack resonators coupled to waveguide, kind of which is a traditional configuration, but we only optimize the coupling regions here and here, and you see they're different until we achieve the desired transmission characteristics, which are these Fano resonance and Lorentzian resonance. And experimentally measured transmission versus theoretical prediction are, are shown here. So you can really kind of hit it exactly uh, uh, the, way, the way you like, uh, or whatever is required for the operation. And then when you measure the system, it, you see predicted behavior uh, in the regime where you, uh, this works because there is a dynamic power range where it works. You are blocking backward transmission that would be trans pulses in the yellow slots, but you are uh, passing forward transmission, forward transmitted pulses, which are the pulses in the orange slots. Uh, you can do that at 10 gigahertz rate or even higher. We measure 10 gigahertz because we had the, the equipment for that, but you see forward transmission is going through, backward, this which is blue, is completely blocked. Outside of the dynamic power range, you are not blocking backward transmission, but there is a pretty large dynamic power range where it works. Obviously, when you couple a lot of power, then this will break, but you know, there is a range in, in which it works and you can design your system to work in that range. And practically, we also use this for ranging measurements, optical ranging measurements, which is important for LiDAR, uh, because uh, if you send pulses, reflect them from a target, once they're reflected, you need to redirect them somewhere into a detector and measure delay between your forward and backward pulses in order to estimate distance to your target. And of course, there are traditional solutions for this, some of which are listed here, or some novel solutions, including lithium ni niobate electro-optic modulators. But all of those solutions are uh, kind of pretty expensive. Some of them are not very fast. Some of them consume a lot of energy uh, or have a big footprint. So we showed that instead of all of this, we can do exactly the same function on the silicon chip with our non-reciprocal element because our non-reciprocal element would block backward pulses and you can pick them up from another port. And we have much smaller footprint. We have very small uh, insertion loss, 0.17 dB, right? So we can design it to be very, pretty much lossless. Uh, we have very high speed and we have very small footprint, um, smaller than, than all of the other solutions. And this is basically a passive circuit. So there is no biasing, um, and any, any power consumption for any type of biasing or so on. Uh, and with this, we did measurements of up to 60 meters uh, uh, to target, which means that and you, you have uh, new functionality for silicon photonics. Uh, it's much uh, less expensive and easier to add two extra rings with some couplers on your silicon integrated circuit if you're building LiDAR than to externally add some, some modulator or switch that is this quite expensive and, and worry about coupling these elements. So that was one functionality. The other new functionality that we worked on was on, on chip uh, laser integrated laser driven particle accelerator. Um, this is a really new functionality, right? So we're talking here about accelerating charged particles using optical fields. Uh, people have done proof of concept demonstrations that you could do that, but none of them were scalable. Uh, and if you would really like to build accelerator which employs laser, then you like in traditional accelerators have to scale to stay, uh, add a lot of stages, uh, one after the other, until you can accelerate particles to sufficient energies uh, that are useful for some applications. And you know that traditional accelerators are miles long uh, to reach target energies, but they use RF, uh, uh, RF uh, fields, uh, microwave fields for acceleration. So if you just scale everything down and use optical frequencies, you can obtain large size reduction, right? About a factor of 10,000, simply by looking at the argument of scaling wavelength uh, of the uh, fields that you're using for acceleration. But of course you can't take traditional RF accelerators and shrink components to optical frequencies because they would simply not work or be, be lossy. So we had to kind of redesign all the elements of, of uh, accelerator stages in order to build a laser driven particle accelerator. And we've been successful in that. I mean, we use here silicon on insulator. We decided to use silicon because again, we can rely on foundry to make 
100 or 1000 stages of accelerator, which is what we're doing now. But in the results that we demonstrated um, uh, about a year ago, we managed to demonstrate a single stage of the accelerator, which is something we fabricated at Stanford. And right now we're stacking them up using foundry fabrication to build a larger kind of multi-stage accelerator. So here's how the stage looks like. You couple electrons from a side, um, we use 83.4 uh, kilo electron volt electron beam from a modified scanning electron microscope. You couple laser on, through optimized couplers. You guide them, guide laser uh, beam here down the waveguide. And this is optimized uh, stage of the accelerator, which is completely non-intuitive. Your electrons would pass through this vacuum stage here, vacuum uh, waveguide here. But you see that the field pattern is designed in such a way that fields are always in phase with the incoming electron so that they accelerate it, don't decelerate it. And for that, we need to do inverse design because otherwise it would have not work. So in a 30 micrometer stage, um, we were able to accelerate electrons by about 1.5 kilo electron volts. Um, which means that we have acceleration of greater than 30 mega electron volts per meter. Um, and of course, that one and a half kilo electron volt doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind that this is only 30 microns. So, so if you stack up 100 or 1,000 of this, which would still be only an inch of a silicon vapor, you can go to mega electron volt energies, which are already useful for medicine. And that's, that's what we're working on right now. And uh, we're, again, relying on foundry-based fabrication to do that. So this is a new functionality enabled by inverse design. We spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this with traditional photonics, but we couldn't. Uh, and then with inverse design, it was, it was beautifully enabled. Uh, there are a lot of other things you can do. Um, you can do dispersion engineering, you know, for example, micro resonator dispersion to obtain flat spectrum for frequency combs by inserting some phase delay elements that are optimized to, to give you certain phase for certain frequency. You can do slow light engineering you know, people have spent many years in photonic crystal research uh, trying to optimize low light waveguides by tweaking slightly bands of photonic crystals. Um, but there is only so much you can do by manual parameter tuning. In this case, you can kind of draw design target, which is uh, uh, achieving slow light in a large wavelength range, and then optimize the structure. And you see that your design target of group index of 25 is achieved after optimization, which is fabrication constraint optimization. And one segment of your photonic crystal waveguide would look like what is shown here in the final uh, picture, right? So, so again, something fully fabricable, but not something people have come up on, on uh, by using brute force approaches in the past. And finally, I'd like to spend the last five minutes or so telling you how this also applies to quantum, right? Because there was quantum in the title of my talk and about half of my group works on quantum applications. Of course, there is no you know, big difference between photonics. Photonics is photonics. There are a lot of sim same elements that you need to use also in quantum systems and classical systems, but you have to work with different materials. And uh, materials that my group works with are uh, diamond and silicon carbide at the moment. Uh, we also did a lot of work on 3.5 materials. Um, inverse design is completely agnostic regarding with regards to platform. You just need to know properties of the material in terms of refractive index and so on. And also you need to know fabrication constraints because for us, for example, fabricating diamond is much harder than fabricating silicon. So our minimum feature sizes that we can achieve using the same e-beam tools and etchers at Stanford are much bigger for diamond than for silicon. And we have to take that into account when designing uh, elements. And of course, the refractive index of diamond is different than refractive index of silicon. But despite all of that, um, we can kind of take into account all of those constraints and design devices that are compatible with our fabrication that significantly outer, outperform traditional approaches to you know, photonic components, including couplers. So we, for example, with these uh, optimized couplers, we see uh, reduction in experimental time by a factor of 500 because we dramatically boosted coupling efficiency at the input and output. And that's a simple thing to do, which is changing, you know, reducing your experimental time by a factor of 500. So suddenly you don't really need to wait for days to collect your photo statistics. You can do it in a matter of minutes, which means that it's, it's much more uh, scalable as well. And the other material also that we are working on is silicon carbide. Um, silicon carbide is a very exciting material because 
uh, in a, apart from hosting quantum emitters, it's also available on vapor scale in bulk uh, form. Uh, it's silicon compatible. Fabrication approaches are pretty much the same as what you use for silicon insulator. Um, it also has excellent thermal conductivity, piezoelectric, uh, large band gap. People use it to make power electronic circuits already um, and uh, sensors and MEMS uh, structures for um, kind of extreme environment applications. And um, it has also strong second order optical nonlinearity, which is not uh, too much smaller relative to lithium niobate. It's a factor of two to three smaller. But as I'll show you in a moment, photonics is much, much simpler to fabricate. So you kind of compensate for that reduction in second order nonlinearity by, by making higher quality photonics. And of course, there is a lot of interest in lithium niobate right now. And of course, silicon photonics has been the, the um, workhorse platform for photonics for the past 20 years. Um, but a lot of this has been enabled by production of high quality tin films of uh, either silicon on insulator, that, which was commercialized about 20 years ago, or lithium niobate on insulator, which was commercialized about 10 years ago. So when we got into um, working on silicon carbide, there was no commercial silicon carbide on insulator. Um, although bulk silicon carbide vapors were commercialized about 20 years ago. So, uh, or yeah, about 30 years ago even. So we actually had to uh, work on developing tin film silicon carbide on insulator ourselves. And we just did a very simple thing of vapor bonding silicon carbide onto oxidized silicon and then grinding, polishing, thinning, and we obtained very high purity films that even didn't degrade properties of quantum emitters inside. And with that platform, um, we could fabricate very high quality structures, uh, resonators with quality factors greater than 5 million, loss of 0.8 dB per centimeter, which is comparable to kind of foundry-based silicon nitride platform. And this is also fully compatible with inverse design, right? The fabrication of silicon carbide is really simple. It's kind of like making silicon on insulator, so uh, photonics, so we can actually make a variety of circuits here uh, much easier than in diamond. We demonstrated uh, also nonlinear photonics uh, early on, second harmonic generation with efficiency of 360% per watt. Uh, but now that should be updated to about 36,000% per watt because we have much higher quality factors or their magnitude higher quality factors. And recently, we've also been working on optical parametric oscillation and frequency comps. So we demonstrated optical parametric oscillation uh, with 8 milliwatt thresholds. Uh, using this structure uh, about like six months ago. Uh, and uh, uh, very recently also we demonstrated soliton frequency comb in uh, this material, which is very exciting um, because uh, as you probably know, soliton frequency combs, uh, which have been demonstrated in other materials, including uh, maybe silicon nitride and tantal are the leading platforms for, for soliton combs are, are uh, very actively used in um, um, development of optical interconnects, also metrology, there is a beautiful work from, from the groups of Scott Papp uh, and also Karthik Srinivasan at NIST and, and uh, also Tobias Kippenberg at EPFL um, and uh, Kerry Vahala, of course, at, at uh, Caltech. So we're actually looking into this in silicon carbide and we think that this can have some very exciting applications once you actually get to this stable frequency conversion. Um, and finally, I'd like to finish with the outlook for all of this. I mean, although this looks very exciting, uh, there are a lot of problems that we haven't solved and that I think would be very interesting problems to solve going forward. Uh, one of the problems that we're thinking about right now, particularly in the context of quantum photonics, is what we call tentatively quantum inverse design. Um, and just to remind you, photonics inverse design is kind of summarized with this picture, which means that you couple high-speed electromagnetic simulator with a high-speed optimizer and then you optimize your photonic structure for a particular performance. And you just need some kind of accurate differentiable simulation models in order to, to implement that. What we've been uh, thinking about for the past year or so, and even have some, some preliminary results that I'll share with you is a quantum hardware design, which means that you kind of combine open quantum system simulator instead of electromagnetic simulator. So you have something that efficiently simulates your Hamiltonian. I mean, it's another kind of 
baby equation that you're simulating, but, but you have to simulate it fast. And you couple that with the optimizer. And that optimizer is the same optimizer that you use in your um, electromagnetic inverse design because it's just some kind of gradient descent method. So we, uh, once you do that, then you potentially can optimize the system uh, to achieve desired Hamiltonian, desired performance of the quantum system. And although we're already kind of designing electromagnetic structure to improve performance of quantum photonics and quantum system, this is a new thing, which was, this means that you are also affecting whatever quantum emitters that you have in your system and electromagnetic structure and redesigning the whole thing together in order to achieve desired performance. And here is one, so far, still theoretical uh, result that we have, how you can improve quantum transduction. Quantum transduction means that you are converting microwave signal to an optical uh, photon, right, in order to connect superconducting quantum systems uh, optically. And um, kind of leading proposals to do that, um, or maybe uh, leading in terms of practicality, are based on coupling ensembles of quantum emitters and then using microwave and optical transitions, driving them simultaneously with microwave and optical fields, and, and using that to basically map microwave to optical signal. And you can do better if you use ensemble relative to using a single emitter. But then the problem is that when you have these solid state emitters, they have differences in transmission uh, transition frequencies, which we call inhomogeneous broadening. And that's what limits scaling of these systems all the time. So we were wondering whether we can overcome this inhomogeneity by optimizing some kind of driving on the system. And that's certainly what you can do. You can change the shape of your microwave drive or your optical drive and maybe that improves the performance. And it turns out that by optimizing driving, you can improve performance by a factor of about 10, right? So you go from, from negligible transduction efficiencies to some decent transduction efficiencies, despite realistic uh, inhomogeneities in the system. Or another problem, you know, let's say you would like to do, apart from quantum transduction, build a quantum node where you have few emitters inside of the cavity that you would use as your quantum node and quantum memory. Again, your discrepancies in the transition frequencies would limit system performance. So if you have different emitters in the cavity, you will see transitions of these emitters and the cavity. They're not going to be strongly coupled to the cavity and you need some collective coupling in order to implement the quantum node. Uh, we were wondering here, I mean, and again, this is not something you can experimentally tweak. Uh, there was a beautiful work at Harvard where they managed to tune, tune, tune two silicon vacancies in diamond cavity, but they were lucky that they could tune them with the same magnetic field. In a general case, you can't really, within 200 nanometers, tweak every emitter separately, right? So we were wondering whether we can apply some, some optimized drive uh, and then microwave drive in this case, but the same global drive to all of them and start ship them in such a way that they produce kind of collective coupling to a cavity. And it turns out that that's possible that with the optimized microwave drive in transmission, you recover collective coupling. And we're working on these experiments right now, but I hope this gives you the idea that optimization of quantum systems go way beyond just optimizing photonic structure. And another thing that we're working on is addressing computational bottleneck. Uh, everything that I've shown you is sort of limited to simulation volumes that are on the order of um, 10 microns on the or uh, in each linear dimension, right? So you have three dimensional structure that is maybe 10 microns in each linear dimension. Uh, the problem with going to much larger structures and some of the structures, including some uh, isolator designs or meta surfaces are, are much bigger than that, right? So how do you use inverse design to design the whole meta surface, which is millimeters in size, instead of redesigning individual blocks? If you take our traditional inverse design, simulation time would blow up. You know, of course you can wait for a very long time to design it, but do you really want to wait two months to see that it, the optimization doesn't work, right? So we're trying to kind of reduce the simulation time, which is the, the bottleneck for large structures in order to expand this to much, much larger devices. And we're developing their um, uh, new methods uh, for that. Um, I mean, one thing that we're trying to do is just use the same electromagnetic solvers, but speed them up uh, by uh, using machine learning. And we've shown that we can speed them up by a factor of about 10, because as you are optimizing your structure, you are solving very similar structures. You can fix some pixels, but then electromagnetic field is very similar 
in subsequent iteration. So as, what we're doing here is we're training neural networks to, as we're solving the problem to kind of speed up subsequent electromagnetic simulations. And we've shown that we could, in principle, have a 10 to 50 fold reduction in the number of iterations needed to numerically solve electromagnetic field in each iteration by using this. So this is work in progress. You know, we did uh, some, some uh, preliminary work about a year ago, but there is uh, still, still more work to be done. And then for meta surfaces, we're also looking into completely new types of simulators that are um, much better suited for solution of meta surfaces, which are kind of scattering problems, multiple scattering problems. Uh, so in this case, we're developing transition matrix methods, which rely on solving this problem in a basis that is suitable for, for uh, th this particular scattering scattering problem. And we call that, um, uh, again, transition matrix method. Uh, and we already have, uh, in terms of simulation, significant reduction relative to finite difference time domain methods, which of course are kind of methods that work for even large scale structures are very, but are very slow, right? They always converge, but they they end up being very slow. Uh, we showed that we can significantly reduce the simulation time. And you see that our approach wins as you go to larger simulation sizes. <laughs> so we're distributing this to GPUs and, and scaling it up. And the hope is that we can simulate and optimize the whole large matter, matter surface at, at once, uh, uh, once, once this is completely resolved, because optimization part will be the same. So with that, I hope that I, uh, managed to um, uh, convince you that photonics optimization is critical for uh, scalable and practical systems. And if you're interested in playing with basic version of our software, you can just download it right away from GitHub, or you can uh, license uh, our software from, from Stanford. Um, also, even if you are in academia, yeah, we, we give out uh, uh, academic licenses and you can actually also read about this in our review article we recently published. And uh, let me just finish by thanking uh, my group and funding and collaborators and thank all of you for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, Yelena, that's uh, a fantastic and uh, a fascinating uh, journey through uh, uh, looking at uh, inverse design across a wide array of applications. So thank you very much. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll also invite our audience to uh, contribute questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, if you have uh, uh, questions you'd like to answer here. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll start with a question uh, that you, you covered a, a wide variety, uh, and it looks like you know, optimization has uh, many opportunities, uh, and there, there's tr opportunities for dramatic improvements in performance and also computational efficiency. What, what would you think is, or what would you, uh, uh, um, What's your perspective on what is the most uh, important challenge facing optimization? Is it, is it, it seems to me there's still a require, requirement for human ingenuity in designing objective functions. You know, deciding yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. Is that, well, that, is that kind of yeah. the bottleneck? Is, are the humans the bottleneck? I would say not, no, uh, not, not yet for the problems that we're working with, because uh, you are right that uh, um, uh, kind of objective function has to be changed when you're designing different problems, right? But that's uh, something that, uh, uh, at least for the problems that we've addressed so far, you can, uh, I, I, you have to make modifications, but kind of people gain experience there yeah. and they, they have no problem uh, changing them. And, you know, all the problems are different. There is similarity in the objective functions. We always care about efficiency or some minimum feature yeah. sizes and so on. Um, I think computational bottleneck is uh, real, right? Because that limits how, how far you can go. Of course, you know that you know, if you want to have 100 channel WDM system, you can't do it in 10 microns with high efficiency, right? Which means that you need to yeah. run optimization of something that is bigger and you will be limited by computational bottleneck. Um, so that you can uh, address it by brute force ap approach or just using FDTD. But again, you never know when you start this, whether it will converge. So I, I, I don't think that that's a good solution because you don't want to wait too long to obtain your result. So right. developing faster, better solvers, electromagnetic solvers is a important problem. And that's what I was highlighting at the end of the talk. Uh, yeah. So that's one, one uh, bottleneck. The other actually bottleneck 
uh, which is something that we're also working on in collaboration with Stephen Boyd, who is optimization expert and applied mathematician, is the problem of bounds, right? So you, when you start this, you don't really know how big your device has to be, right? You try like three microns, and if it doesn't work, then you slightly expand, but you don't really know for the target efficiency or target objective function how like large footprint needs to be or, or with the given footprint, what efficiency you can get. And we, we've been working on this, and there is also very nice work uh, by Alejandro Rodriguez and Owen Miller uh, on the problem of bounds and that community yeah. of people working on bounds is actually actively growing. Uh, but we have to um, um, basically um, solve this problem better uh, and, and incorporate it into the optimizer because optimizers should kind of suggest you the footprint before you start optimizing. You don't want to spend time um, optimizing and then figuring out that there is no solution, right? And right. I, I think that is very important and it will give us more understanding of the problem. But I view those as the main bottlenecks right now. And um, I think, uh, and of course, the computational bottleneck is also related to problem of designing metallic devices. The same thing yeah. as, you know, in plasmonics, as you know, know really well, yeah. uh, you have to um, really use fine discretization. So simulations are, are very long. Um, so how do you optimize plasmonic structure? There fundamentally nothing prohibits you from doing that as long as you have an uh, efficient solver. Uh, so so yeah. solving this problem of, of good electromagnetic solvers uh, and fast electromagnetic solvers will open a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So uh, we have a number of questions here. And uh, the first one, I think you answered about the inverse design uh, for metasurfaces, which is uh, to look at these uh, uh, transfer uh, uh, matrix. Transition uh, matrix, approaches. yes. Yeah. Um, a second question here uh, is about the stopping criteria for the optimization from convergence. Uh, is it is it is it pretty simple to determine when you've uh, you know when you should stop or when you should yeah. when you converge? Yeah, so I, I think it's pretty. I mean, we do stop when we reach a target efficiency, right? And but it is also sometimes possible that it you see that it's not converging to that target efficiency because you see your whatever figure of merit, let's say, um, uh, transmission efficiency kind of saturating at some value, be, be, which is below what, what you would like to have a target, which means that you are converging some local optimum, which is not a good local yeah. optimum. So you as an optimum designer, you can monitor and kind of interrupt the process. And uh, this is also why I was uh, uh, emphasizing that the first turnaround time is very uh, important because that doesn't mean that you need to monitor it for two weeks and then stop uh, with yeah. the current structures using these GPU solvers, uh, sorry, GPU, uh, um, gaming GPUs, we can actually yeah. do it within few hours, which means that you can kind of interrupt it and restart if you think that it's not working well and reinitialize. But mm -hmm. um, you, um, we, we do have this first stage of continuous permittivity optimization uh, so if that stage fails, then you pretty much know that you are off in terms of the footprint, right? So if you cannot really in continuous optimization get to a solution, that means that you should really restart the process because that yeah. continuous optimization has a bigger parameter space. Uh, and if that one doesn't converge, that means that it's not going to be binary solution in the second phase. So that also speeds it up, right? Okay. So, and here's an a, a imp important question, which is, uh, question about uh, sort of global solutions convexity. How do you avoid uh, converging to local minima uh, with low efficiency? Uh, if you, and, you know, essentially, uh, yeah. uh, it, it, and, uh, essentially the question about global, uh, you know, optimization. Yes, yeah, so we actually don't care if it's global optimum as long as it's a good optimum. So this is yeah. basically our perspective. Of course, gradient descent is a local optimization. And I personally don't think that global optimum is uh, necessary. As I said, for the wavelength splitter shown behind me, there are six good local optima. And good for us means greater than 90% efficiency, uh, robust to temperature variation. In this case, we, we, it was pretty extreme, like 100 degrees and plus minus eight nanometer fabrication uh, um, constraints. So, you know, do you really care which, if it's global optimum? I don't think so if it's kind of good enough local optimum, right? Mm -hmm. But but there is a, certainly a question of local optima that do not satisfy your objective function. Yeah. And this is what I was discussing in response to the previous question. Yeah. Um, the only way to assure that, I mean, you can monitor 
monitor and interrupt and restart the simulation so you don't go there. And we've, we've done some other things which are kind of related to restarting or changing trajectory. Okay, let me just move, do, move to the, do you hear me well? Uh, yeah. Because my headphones stopped working. Okay, yeah, no, good. That's, uh... Yeah, <laughs> uh, battery, battery drained. But basically that's the answer to the previous question that, yeah. that you have to be, make sure that you don't get stuck in a bad lock a lot. In yeah, okay, good. Well, um, I wanna thank you, Yelena. That's uh, been a fantastic tour through the uh, subject of inverse design. Uh, and thanks to you and of course your fantastic team at Stanford and uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the whole audience uh, from ACS Photonics for joining us.